Hi, good morning, and welcome back to Create, Share, Inspire podcast. We have a hard time finding a good spot because it's so bright here this morning. Welcome back to the podcast. I know I'm a couple minutes late this morning, and I apologize for that. I uh, got awfully distracted looking at hurricane updates overnight. Where did I put my tea? There it is. So, been way too preoccupied with weather news, and I apologize for that. And ran a little late this morning. Uh, if you're joining me live, please say hello. And I'll wait a few seconds before beginning. Ah, I missed a few names. I <laughs> Becky and Grace and Lucy and uh, Vio and Lily and Melissa, Lucy, Glory. Thanks for joining live. I put my hair in pin curls last night, and when I took them out this morning, they looked so crazy that I put my hair in a ponytail instead. Maybe it's better now? Yeah, it's a little bit better. Good morning, Val. Missed a bunch of names again. Good morning, Diana and Marsha. Thanks for joining live. Got a very busy show scheduled for this morning. Got lots to talk about. First, I wanted to do a recap of some of the things we talked about last night because I know not everybody makes it to the morning and evening podcasts. So I did want to mention that the Abigail stitch pattern tutorial is now live and I know many people have been downloading it and are so in love with the concept that I'm working on. So really love the validation that my hard work is teaching people and making people happy and empowering people to explore their yarn a little more. So I'm super excited about that. The PDF download is over 30 pages long and it starts with each one starts with a stitch or a stitch pattern. So for example, this is the Abigail two row repeat of a pretty columned shell stitch pattern. And so in the PDF tutorial, you learn how to work it in rows then how to do that same stitch pattern in rounds, even in rounds. Then you learn how to do a top-down triangle shape with it, with increasing, how to make a square motif, how to make a circular motif, how to make a hexagon motif, and also how to make a rectangle motif. So in each one of the PDFs going forward, whatever stitch pattern that I'm exploring in the PDF, you're gonna learn all seven of those shapes with in-depth photos, charts, as well as written line-by-line -line instructions and information on how to continue repeating, continue repeating the, uh, in that fashion or in that, um, in the ratio that you're increasing so that you can make it any size. So like for example, on the top down triangle, the chart ends here, the written instructions end here, but there's notations on how to continue, how to repeat those last two rows so that you can continue and make a beautiful finished shawl. So then not only does it show you how to do that, but then there are 90 project suggestions in the PDF. So within each of those shapes, I give you a suggestion of a bunch of different projects using that shape and using those instructions with dimensions on what are the dimensions for all the different size. What is the dimension for um, a receiving blanket, a baby blanket, a toddler blanket, uh, a twin bed, a lapgan? What are the dimen What are the dimensions for scarves for different ages of children, different sizes of women, different sizes of men? All of that information is included too. So these are ex exceptional resource tools to have for making gifts or just wanting to explore yarn on your own without always necessarily needing a pattern. And it's a great way to learn more about crochet. There'll be knitting ones coming too, but for right now they're in crochet. To learn more about crochet and to empower yourself to really explore more with your yarn. All the PDFs are only $3.99, so the Abigail, with all of this information on the Abigail stitch, is $3.99, plus it comes with three patterns. Each one, each PDF will come with at least one pattern. This one I happen to do three because they kind of just went together. So there's a baby hat in this stitch pattern, then there's a mommy version of the hat in this stitch pattern, and there's also a beautiful square 
baby blanket with a ruffled border. And as we were talking about this last night on the podcast, it we discussed that if you did this in maybe be so fine or be so sporty yarn and made a rectangular shawl or square shawl instead, folded it in half, a little offset, you would have a double, a doubled triangular shawl with a tiered ruffle border. How incredibly gorgeous is that as a shawl? And I'll turn around so you can see what that would look like on. Isn't that beautiful? I did not post a link to the tutorial in the video description this morning, but I will update that when the podcast is over. You can also find a recent blog post that tells you all about the PDF tutorial, as well as where to find it and how to download it. Um, and it's on my website under single patterns, the, that part of the shop. Also, we, uh, we've been talking about the crochet workshop magazine that features my brand new mandala on the cover as well as a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make crochet flowers and then how to make my beautiful mandala with foundation oval fringe and crochet flowers and i'm doing a giveaway the magazine gave me two copies of the magazine so if you go to my blog one of my other more recent blog posts is announcing the magazine telling you where you can purchase it as well as saying if you leave a comment on it you can um i will be randomly choosing a winner winner on september 15th now if we have time this morning i have three different projects in three different stages of blocking that i thought would be fun to um show you and do some demoing on this morning but before we do that i did want to give an update for um, hurricane stuff. I don't know what's going to be happening here on Monday. It sounds like the storm has slowed down again and it's possible that the storm's hitting Monday afternoon or Monday evening, not Monday morning anymore. Um, depending on what the weather is like here and what kind, if we've evacuated or whatever, there may or may not be a podcast Monday morning, obviously. So I will try to give updates as I can, but just going forward next week might be a little iffy. So let's just uh, hope for the best and I will communicate with you when I can. Thanks, Judy. I'm trying to stay safe. I have, uh, done some shopping I'll probably go back to the stores today it's going to be a madhouse I mean the stores already have like last night I couldn't get any more water uh, at the store that I went to so I've been to three stores now that have sold out of water I do have some backup though and I've bought some food we do have a freezer full of meat and a barbecue so I will be if uh, I will be doing that first and then our backup backup is a bunch of canned food so uh yeah and then we've got stuff that we have to do to prep the house should it come but it, it's too soon to know where the hurricane's going we just know that it's a major storm coming um and even if it doesn't come here we will get affected even if it doesn't come to my area because of the strength and the size of it but uh, hope it doesn't come here. Anyway, uh, we've got a lot to do to prep still and a lot of patience to use to wait to find out what's gonna happen. But um, having said all that, I won't know about the podcast until much further along either. So just know that I will go live when I can and if I can, um, and I just don't know at this point. So, now I think we could get to our busy stuff. I've got three different projects in three different states uh, and for, that need blocking for three different reasons and in three different stages of completion. So I'm gonna fix, I'm gonna make my tripod a little taller here because we're gonna be standing up. Okay, let's see if that'll work. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna use this table over here Oh, I need to grab one more thing. Uh, 
All right, so I get asked an awful lot about blocking all the time. And I think it's wonderful that people are asking me because I have years and years of experience doing it and I'm more than happy to share my knowledge. Okay. So, some, I get, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, what do you do differently for two-dimensional versus three-dimensional pieces? Like, it's kind of a no-brainer. A flat item, you lay flat to dry, right? But what about something that you wear, something that's three-dimensional, something that has shaping, like a vest, a cardigan, a pullover? How do you dry those? Um, depending on how thin the yarn is, it's okay to double the fabric and still lay it flat to dry, especially if you're going to have any amount of um, circulating air to help the process go quicker. But the other thing to do is, and this is only if you have it, like I said, if you don't have it, laying flat to dry with a doubled surface is totally fine, but otherwise having a dress form on hand is really handy for um, drying something that has shape. So the first thing that we're blocking this morning is the new version of the Summer Love and Vest. And anytime we soak something in water, we want to squeeze out the excess water, but do not wring it. You don't want to wring it because then you could end up manipulating the stitches and or damaging your work. And what's the point of putting all that work into something and then damaging it? No point. So it's still super wet. I'm going to wrap it in a towel. Like that. Roll it up. squeeze out that water. At this point, as long as you're not twisting it or squeezing it, can I get far enough to get on the floor? I'm going to stand on it. And all this does is press more water out of my vest and into the towel. So as long as I don't squeeze it or twist it, as long as I don't twist it and I'm just applying direct pressure on it, all that will do is express more water out of my garment and into the towel. Okay, it's, mo it's still pretty wet, but it's damp wet now. And so here is the vest. I will grab my dress form. And we're gonna let it sit there to dry, okay? So if you have a three-dimensional piece and you're not comfortable doubling the fabric and laying it flat to dry. If you can get a hold of a dress form, um, that will work really well too. Now, if this is actually a dress form where I've taken it off of the stand so that it just lays flat on a table. Um, uh, no, this pattern is still in works. That's why it's blocking right now. It has not been photographed. The pattern has not been edited. In fact, if anybody is uh, experienced with tech editing of patterns and would like to work for me, if you would like to email me, that would be great. I would love to talk to someone about some part-time work tech editing patterns with short turnarounds. So if anybody has experience with that, um, let me know best way to do that is to contact me via email and the contact me button on my website. So that would be the easiest way to do that, but that would be fun. And anyway, so this one's just still in the process, but I'm showing you a blocking tutorial this morning, not showing you the actual tutorial yet. That will come a little further down the road. But in the meantime, I wanted to tell you that this piece now is the piece that I'm doing for the magazine and it needs to be blocked before I add more modular pieces to it. I do not think it's necessary to completely wet block it like this, but I could wet block it like this too. So also, I have this water. Yes, that vest is crocheted. This and this one is crocheted also. Um, I have that water with the rapture in it. I could use it again right now. It's not like I washed something that was dirty. I just washed, the, the yarn was brand new, the garment wasn't dirty. Um, the water's not dirty. I could use that again. The only thing about reusing your water, if you're gonna use it back to back like this,
do your lighter items first and your darker items later because you never know when something's going to bleed a little bit. Not all yarn bleeds. Yarn doesn't bleed all the time, but occasionally it does. And in order to be safe and not damage anything that you've worked really hard on, just make sure you do them in order of light to dark. So I blocked that one first. I could definitely block this one next, which means I could pop it in the water, but I'm still on the fence about that. I really think that I want to block this one lightly because I want it to dry quickly so I can keep moving and start working on the other modular components. So I want it to block, I want to block it so I can see what my gauge is and see where it's going, but I don't need to go the whole route and I don't want to wait that long. So I may block this one with pins and boards and mist block it or use the steam on my iron. The next pieces that I have that are due for blocking are the next PDF tutorials, well, the second to next. So first we did single crochet stitch pattern tutorial. Then we did the Abigail stitch pattern tutorial. Next up is going to be half double crochet. And then after that is going to be the Ellen stitch pattern. And that is this stitch pattern. These are not blocked yet. So what I'm going to do is pin these out on a board and then I will um, hit them with a steam iron. And when I say hit them with a steam iron, what I really mean is I'm going to cover them with a towel and put indirect steam on the pieces. Okay, you could wet block these as well, but Again, these, uh, these pieces I want to dry really quickly so that I can get them to photography. And they're not something that's going to be used for other than demonstration and photo. So it's not as important to get um, a strong blocking. Oh, there's my pins, they're right next to me. So for these, I'm just going to pin them out in the way that we always pin stuff out, starting in the corners and then working in midpoints. So anything that I do for blocking these is the same, or pinning these, is the same type of process that I would do for anything bigger as well. Now on that other piece, the Ruana, I was, um, oh, the yarn for both of those pieces that I showed you so far is Be So Fine Yarn. This is Be So Fine Yarn in colorway Celestial Blue Mist, and this is Be So Fine Yarn in colorway Parisian Bordeaux. And these swatches here are Be So Fine Yarn, or Be So Baby Yarn. So for these, we started in the corners, and now we're gonna work in the midpoints, always working to halfway. And notice as soon as I work north, I work south. As soon as I work east, I work west. So constantly trying to be symmetrical, and by really being mindful of being symmetrical, that is how I ended, end up getting a, symmetric, a symmetrically pinned out and blocked piece. If you don't do it this way, at least if I don't do it this way, and I come to the end and I do an overhead shot, almost all the time it is not symmetrical. So I find that the best practice for me is to just follow these rules from the beginning and then I never have to worry about redoing it. Well, maybe not never. Sometimes I still have to redo it, especially on a larger piece like a shawl. But for smaller pieces like this, if I follow these practices, most of the time I'm successful the first time. And don't we like that? Don't we being, like being successful the first time around? <laughs> I know I do. Okay, so next up is going to be, so we did, we have the Ellen stitch pattern in rows, and then we have the circular, the Ellen stitch pattern in a circular motif. And next up, we're going to be doing the, um, it, the Ellen stitch pattern in rounds. And so for this one, we're gonna be working through double thicknesses again, right? Um, one thing that I notice is when I work through double thicknesses, I want to be really careful to not pull too much on the folded edges 
because you end up getting points there and you don't want points there. Uh, oh, good, Joe. I'm glad this is helpful for you. Let's see, is this going to have room here? Not really. Okay, so we'll come back over here. Am I in the way now? Yeah, kind of. Maybe, maybe not. So when I'm when I'm showing you these little pieces, I'm kind of thinking about reminding, I want to remind you that everything that I'm doing right now would apply to bigger pieces of this. So for the two dimensional flat one, this would be like blocking a scarf. For the round one, this would be like blocking a circular shawl or circular motifs that you're gonna to join to a project um, or, or a doily or anything that you're gonna keep circular. This is how you would block any size project that is circular. Imagine if this was a half circle shawl. We would have done this the exact same way, except we'd have done midpoints along the straight edge here and the midpoints along the curved edge here. So on a piece like this that's doubled because it's worked in the round, this, what I'm showing you, is how you would block a cowl. So we're going to try to keep our lower edges nice and straight. And I'm going to focus there first. And I'm being careful to grab both thicknesses so that both edges are going to be straight. If I don't, if I'm not careful to grab the edge below it, it'll get pulled up inside. And the more I stretch the opposite side, the more it will get pulled up. And then you won't have a straight edge when this is dry. Now notice I am blocking these, I am blocking these or pinning these dry this morning because I'm gonna come back through with an iron later. And for modular pieces like that, I think that that is fine. I find it is way too difficult to steam block a finished garment like this. I way prefer bigger pieces to be wet. It's just too time consuming and not, not always as effective. But on smaller pieces, I find the steam blocking is very quick, very easy. And as long as you don't put the hot steam directly on the yarn, it won't damage the yarn either. So putting a tea towel or some sort of thin towel down first so that the steam doesn't hit it directly is your insurance policy that you aren't going to burn your yarn. Not all yarns burn, but just to be on the safe side, I, was, I would always recommend doing it. I'm going to turn this so I don't have to bend so far. Duh. Okay, I'll turn it. Actually, maybe the rectangle will fit here. No, the rectangle might fit here. Okay, so next up is the rectangle. I think any of these stitch patterns in the rectangle would make really fancy uh, uh, tablecloths. Someone's mentioning their laundry bag. Yes, laundry bag is a great way to wash things too especially if you're going to put it in the laundry with other things because that way it's not going to get caught on buttons or zippers or any other or velcro god forbid or any other um, element like that on other types of fabric okay so i did the corners first and now i'm working in midpoints and as i'm working in midpoints i'm also finding that my corners aren't straight and that's when I can readjust. That's the other thing about working in midpoints is that sometimes it, allo it allows me to see uh, mistakes quickly so that I'm not, notice not having to wait till that overhead shot at the end when I have to go back and redo the whole thing. Working in midpoints allows me to see that shape transform quickly and I can readjust quickly. I mean, I don't mind taking the time to do this. I do think it's important to be patient and take the time to do it, but I also don't want it to take longer than it needs to. So um, I do like to be very efficient about it. So what I'm sharing with you are my best practices for not only having a successful experience, but also making it um, a quicker-ish experience. <laughs> I know that's not a word. Okay, hexagons of all the shapes here are the hardest, I find, to block because you're not just trying to get those nice square corners, but I don't know, 
the 60 de degree angle and keeping straight edges and staying symmetrical for me is a little bit more difficult than the circles and the squares and the rectangles. So I end up having to readjust these several times, but honestly, this looks pretty good so far. Probably gonna have to pull out on these corners a little more. We'll know more as we do our halfway points, but so far it's pretty good. On bigger pieces, the hexagon gets a little more difficult to manage. And don't forget if you go to totally bigger pieces, like let's say you're doing a baby blanket in the hexagon or a shawl in the hexagon, you could always go to your blocking wires because then at least your six lines would be straight and then you would just have to manipulate the angles of those six lines. That would be helpful. But on a small piece like this, the wires would be more of a pain that a help. See, that looks pretty good. And I didn't get a long enough cord to bring the iron out here, so we'll have to do that as a demo on another day. I'll be doing that off camera when the podcast is over, but I will go over what I'm gonna do again. I'm gonna grab a light kitchen towel, like a tea towel, and I'm going to, let's see, first I wanna make sure this is all symmetrical. That looks pretty symmetrical now. And we're out of space and we have two more to do, so I'll grab another board. up so you can take a look at them while we're working on the next one. Grab another board. I think I did too many rounds on the square. It's not the same size as the other ones. So I'm leaving the tail on this one to decide what I'm going to do with it. But the other ones I've woven in all the ends first. I do always recommend weaving in your tails before uh, blocking. Not every yarn is, well, every yarn is going to be manipulated by water and how it unravels in water is something that you may or may not know before doing it. And if your yarn is going to unravel in water, any amount, it just makes it that much harder to thread it through the eye of a needle for weaving it in. So, I think it's just the better practice to do that step first. So I always weave in my ends first, especially for wet blocking. Last night during the season finale of Queen of the South, I blocked it. I re we had woven all the ends on the vest and on this piece and on all these pieces. I couldn't believe I got that all done within an hour. That was a big job. That was a lot of ends. Okay, I didn't say what I was doing on this one, but I did the same thing that I've been doing all along. We started in our corners in the center, and we worked in midpoints from there, and then went to the midpoints of the midpoints, and I'm just constantly working in opposite sides to keep everything symmetrical. <coughs> There. Look, it's pretty darn symmetrical now. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, so we'll turn this one more time. We'll do our square. Squares. Squares and rectangles are the easiest pieces to block because then it's very obvious what your midpoints are. We start with our four corners. go to our midpoint. So I'm going to start, I started in the south. I did the south midpoint. Then I go to the north midpoint. Then I'm going to go to the west and then go to the east. Now at that point, I don't have to keep going on opposite sides. I feel like I've pulled out all of the sides and corners. If I wanted to do the midpoints 
all along the south edge now before going on to another one that's fine but then i will go to the opposite one so i did the south so now i'll do two pins in the north and now i'll do two pins in the west and then I'll do two pins in the east. Obviously that's from my point of view. It doesn't look like that from yours, but if you think in terms of what, and it doesn't matter which side you started. If you want to start on the east, that's fine too. Okay, we'll pull that one up. Pretty symmetrical. Okay, so now I will take a very fine cloth, a tea, cloth, a tea towel maybe, and lay it over these, take a steam iron, and then put the steam iron directly on it. And that moist heat will relax the fibers and help them to set. And come sit down again, because I know that there were probably a bunch of questions coming on, but honestly, I can't do a tutorial and answer questions at the same time. I'm sure you understand. Let me get ah. Yes, in a perfect world, I would have two tripods in two different uh, heights so that I could move that seamlessly, but I don't, so I apologize. Oh, okay, it's too high again. I am sweating like crazy. So much for those curls. Look at, they're all gone. It's so steamy out here, though. Um, Uh, will hanging it on the dress form stretch it out? I find that on light fabrics like this, I mean, this is an ultra light, light yarn. I do not find that it stretches it out at all, no. Maybe in a worsted weight or something heavier it might, but I have never had a problem with something stretching out like that. But again, it's something that's extremely light, so obviously gravity's not pulling it that far. Um, Judy, do you block the individual motifs for the Mary shawl or do you do it all collectively? Well, for that particular one, the instructions are to join as you go. So you never fasten off those motifs. So no, you would not block that until it's completely done. The only time you would block motifs like I was doing for these, like what I'm doing this morning with these motifs is not something that you would do outside of working on a book or PDF project that I'm doing, right? These are step outs for video and for uh, teaching purposes. But where this does apply is when you're working motifs that will be joined later with a different yarn and you want them all to be uniform first. I have found, this applies to quilting too. I, I've seen people uh, block or steam or iron their blocks before joining them together and I've seen people that make crochet motifs that are then to be joined with something else later I've seen those get blocked so this would be an example of how you would do that if you were blocking modular components that are going to be joined to something else later on does that make sense I don't always I don't have any projects that I can think of off the top of my head that do that in my designs, but I know it exists. And if when it does, this is the way to do it. Plus, I think just demoing something that's small like this, it follows the same rules and guidelines of pinning out something that's much bigger. So what I'm showing you is exactly what I do when I do a larger piece, but it's really hard to get a large piece on camera because I'm on the floor and bent over and you know not so graceful and it's the exact same thing so talking about the corners and the midpoints and the symmetry all of that's the same and all of those shapes represent all of the shapes that we make from shawls and blankets and scarves and all that stuff so all of these practices are things that you would use in the larger pieces as well so that's why I showed you not necessarily because you'd make these this way but because they do, what I'm doing still teaches you and you can still apply it to other sizes. It's still the same rules of symmetry. Does anybody have any other questions? Those are great questions, guys. Guys and gals. <laughs> oh, I can see there's side conversations going on. Well, I won't interrupt those. 
see if there's any questions for me before I move on. All right, so when the podcast is over, I will update the video description with information on how to download the, uh, where to find the Abigail stitch pattern tutorial and how and where to find the blog post on how to enter the drawing to win the magazine. There is a blog post still to win the sunset gift set. So in that set, that's going to end tomorrow, I believe, where you can win the, where's the tote bag? There's a tote bag with this print on it. You get the tote bag, you get the book, the Create, Share, Inspire notebook, and you get the travel mug. It's a nice little set and it's still available. Um, the contest runs through tomorrow, so if you still want to enter, there's time. Thanks, Thea. I'm glad you think my podcasts are informative. I try. Yeah, it is a nice gift set. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, if somebody would like to pick a number between one and five, Oh, who do we have over here? We've got Becker. Hi, sweetheart. You're on camera today. Hi, baby. Oh, you want a little scratchy? No. A little? Hi, baby. Look a good boy. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh, I gotta get back to this, though. I'll cuddle you later, I promise. <laughs> What a sweetheart. Okay, so I see number three. So we will look for issue number three. All right, if I missed any of your questions, please feel welcome to repeat them in the recorded version of the podcast because I uh, do have the ability to see all of those comments throughout the day. I get notified of them. So if I missed your comment, please feel welcome to repeat it there and I will try to get to it. So this is a Chinese proverb, a flower in the heart blossoms on the surface. Isn't that true? The more positively and kindly we think on the inside, the more it shows on the outside. I love this and just a great reminder to try to stay calm and try to stay positive no matter what's going on in your life. I know I'm a little more anxious than I would like to be about the hurricane coming, uh, especially since it's practically the two-year anniversary of Irma, the one that did so much devastation in my area. That was, that'll be two-year anniversary, September 9th, so this is awfully, um, so it'll be awfully, uh, it's awfully strange how close it is, which is just adding to the anxiety, I think, but I needed this quote this morning to remind me that there isn't a darn thing I can do about it today tomorrow, Sunday, and probably part of Monday. It's going to do what it's going to do. So I need to try to stay positive and try to think about positive things and try to be productive and work and love my kitties and love my son and just try to be productive and kind. So thank you to this Chinese proverb for being recorded and saved all these years. A flower in the heart blossoms on the surface. I love it love getting reminders to always let go of what's bothering you and try to find peace and calm and love in some other way. Always great reminders. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy day to spend a few minutes here with me. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial, the show and tell, the sneak peek information, chatting with me and everyone else and the kitties, of course. <laughs> Let us make time to create, share, and inspire today and every day. And I promise to keep you updated uh, when I know something more about the hurricane. Thank you all for your thoughts and prayers. I appreciate it very much. And I promise to keep you updated. Talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. Bye.